Salutations all. And this is basic public speaking. This is the video lesson for style and language. Uh, as always, there are Word documents, publish your PowerPoint presentations, and publish your PDFs that'll go along with this lesson. This is just kind of a recap in this, this video of what's discussed in the lecture and the lesson. So let's go forth. There's a few videos on style and delivery, and then I have one that was, is also posted that has several chapters. This is just more focused on style and language. So if you see me look off the screen, my notes and my book are off to the side, so this is me checking my notes. Um, what is style? Just what is style in itself? Based off of ancient, the ancient Greeks, the first scholars of the wonderful world of communication and public speaking, their idea in explanation of style was much more narrow than what it has become today. Um, Aristotle remarked in his collective consciousness is that, um, and the term in ancient Greek comes from lexis, which literally means word, by what Athenians, that Aristotle's teacher Plato, remember him? was Athenian, but for them, Lexus is, was the way or manner in which one said something that was style. Aristotle just kind of went on to further expand by saying, it's not just what we say, but it's also our word choice, our diction, um, and then centuries later, uh, Cicero, Roman orator, orator, excuse me, expanded it by saying, um, in, under the term of elocutio, it's arguing that you cannot easily separate what one says from how we say it. Whew, that was a lot of names thrown around just to get us our building blocks for discussing style. So, let's kind of fast forward and see if we can break this down a lot easier or make it, make it make sense. There's the cliche, a picture's worth a thousand words. Okay. But now, with the world of social media, there's a thousand pictures. So, it's not really as definitive as what, I don't know, it, to say it was ever really definitive is not correct either, but it's not as hard as it used to be. We're now more so, it's kind of been replaced with the cliche, image is everything. What does this have to do with public speaking, you're asking? We're going to get into that much more in depth here in a few seconds, but think about this. In public speaking, it's not just the words that come out of our mouth to whomever we're speaking to, be it a formal speech, a wedding toast, a graduation, um, speaking in front of a class, speaking in front of colleagues or peers or a group, whatever the case may be here. It's not just the words we choose. There's so much more that goes into it. And in communication in general, but all of this I call the nonverbals. Why? Because, simply put, verbal are words we speak. What I'm saying to you is verbal. The nonverbal is how it is said. And by that, I mean the tone, the intentions, the all that comes into play. Facial expressions, how we hold ourselves, little mannerisms that we have that we may not realize are loud, or how we present ourselves, how we stand, how we hold ourselves, um, how we even dress ourselves. All that comes into play for style in public speaking. And I'll say we're going to break it down a little bit more, but I just wanted to give that little base for you to understand where I'm going with this. 
this whole lesson that we're doing is pretty much the nonverbals. It's how we hold ourselves, how we present ourselves, our choice of language, our choice of words, our choice, you know, familiarity with our audience or our subject or our space or ourselves. So, going forth talks about this finding style of our time. So, the ancient Greeks were focused on Lexus, the word, what we say, and then it's just kind of about how we say it how we do this, how we do this, or do that. And when we go forth, that changes. You think about styles of time. They are clothing styles, music styles, hairstyles, trends that mark a time. And yes, a lot of trends get repeated, but they get a new flair each time they're repeated. Not to age myself horribly, but things that I wore in high school have now come back full circle into trends and also how we present ourselves can also show any associations that we may have with groups or organizations or where we stand so we keep going forth um there's a rhetorical scholar named barry brummett he argues that style is no longer limited to how we express our ideas and feelings nor is it just to our image but it's expanded to how each of us present our, our person to the world. So what does that mean? It's not just how we dress, and it's not just what we say, but it's how we choose to present ourselves. And sometimes that changes. You may present yourself in a different way to a group of colleagues than you would close family members. You may present yourself differently to one group of friends than you do to another group. You may present yourself differently to your professors and teachers than what you would to your grandparents. This is what we're saying here. There's many you. There's you as a, as a person and then there's the person that we try to put out into the world or put out to a certain group. Style is a complex system of actions and objects and behaviors that's used to form messages and announce who we are, who we want to be, and who we want to be considered akin to. That's what I'm talking about. Like, it can also put you, reflect organizations or groups that you are part of um, in a very, very silly example. On Wednesdays, we wear pink. If you know, you know, mean girls. So... All that comes from forth. So let's move deeper and start taking these different little areas that I talked about and break them down. So I said this is a lot about the nonverbals. Well, style as a meaning as from your body and language. So it's the way we move, the way we say things, and the way the words we choose to say those things. And it's being mindful, which to be honest, it can be very hard to be a mindful public speaker because there's so many facets and we discuss audience later on in this course, but there's many facets when it comes to public speaking and how we present ourselves. So when, when I say body language, your choice of words and emotions, intonation, pitch and clarity all come into play. You're going to speak differently to a group of senior citizens than you are to a group of kindergartners. You may present to a group of colleagues different than you would to a group of, peer, of peers. You may present a presentation differently to your teachers than you would, let's say, your significant other. I kind of went extreme in my examples, but it's giving you the idea that, you know, you, we adjust our choice, our, our language choices based on our audience. And using that idea, it's also knowing how well do you know the audience. If you know the group very well, you, can, you tend to go into a more casual, lax choice. But if it's more formal, we go that ladder. And then with body and language as well, presentation, you know, how we present ourselves. If you're wanting to get a promotion, you're going to present yourself in a way that will make the powers to be consider you. 
you know, yes, it should be based off our work ethic. Yes, it should be based off our experience. Yes, it should be this. But sometimes we also, I say play the part in the fact that we present ourselves. I know this is coming up in the, you know, I know this promotion is coming up, this opening, and as I would like to put myself into the running for it. If you're giving a commencement speech, you're going to present yourself in a way that is in fr that shows a formality in front of peers, teachers, educators, staff, and family members, and friends. You know, you think of a commencement ceremony, all of that, and how we choose to dress ourselves. If you're speaking in front of the National Republican Committee or a National Democratic Committee or whatever the political party may be, you're going to present yourself more formally. This is what we're talking about with how we... If the President of the United States, and this is just an example, and be it any President of the United States, goes to give their State of the Union address, are you more likely to take that... that person seriously if they are dressed to fit the mood and the tone and the formality of their position or why don't they just roll in there in like their Sunday pajamas or you know what they wear to the beach whomever the, this person may be or you know they roll in there with some Daisy Duke cutoff shorts and glittery top i don't know i'm just trying to give wild examples here that's what they're talking about with the presentation with body and language now also this comes in the nonverbal. this is i don't want to say big i love nonverbal communication it's one of my favorite areas facial expressions can come into play think rbf but some people are very expressive with their eyes and their eyebrows are constantly moving i have a tendency to chew on my lips at times if that's something you know you do, you know, it's being aware of yourself. I talk with my hands. That's something I'm aware of. I try to hold back, but sometimes it doesn't work so well for me. But it's also little things. Are you a fidgeter? Do you twirl your hair? Do you, you know, are you constantly readjusting your hair? Messing with accessories? You know, these, this all comes with your body and language, how we stand. Are we tall? Do you present yourself open, shoulders back, open, or are you more closed off? Hands in pockets or arms crossed and head down. You're not really focusing in front of you. You're kind of more like direct toward the floor or no one in particular. Are you slouched? Are you aloof? mentality all that comes into play with the nonverbals of public speaking I'm aware of things that I do in my public speaking world I chew on my lip I will lick my lips especially if I don't have on lipstick I talk with my hands and depending on how my hair like if I'm doing a formality thing a lot of times my hair needs to be fixed and kind of out otherwise I'll do that just this pull it out and I get real excited about a topic and really get into it. I get very expressive with my eyebrows. And that's just who I am. So in a formality, a form more formal speaking, I have to be aware of myself. And make sure that I'm open and I'm conveying a more calm demeanor in my facial expressions and my hand movements. Um, Bill Clinton used to... He was very known for doing this when he gave speeches. It's kind of like he was making a point with his hands. That's something of him. Um, just think of all the presidential, all the presidents we have, or presidential elects, or those running, and their stances in public speaking. Your body is implicated in the process of speaking. And what do I know by that? what I say by that? Is that your body issues the voice. It's what we dress up. It's how the moves and the gestures, and it's the part of the human, it's part of you that fills. So, all that comes in. We move up from that, and there's, when there is a high awareness of oneself, that's, 
Sociologist calls this impression management. The book's definition, it refers to the way a person navigates his or her body, his or her self-presentation and body language. It's, what, what do sociologists mean by this? It's just that we are aware of what we are, of, of who we are and how we present ourselves. Like I also know that I have the tendency to talk very fast. I have always been a quick talker, very fast talker. Report cards, talks a lot, talks fast, talks a lot, talks fast. So I have to be aware of my speech pace and my word rate when talking as not to talk so fast that I lose an audience because they just, they don't hear me, they don't get it, my words are like going together. And it, not good for anyone involved. Also, I have a slight speech impediment at times that comes through if I talk too fast. So it just generally comes into play when I'm really excited and I'm trying to get out all these words as quickly as I can before I forget them, then my speech impediment comes through. So that's being aware as well. So there's all kinds of things with our voice. You know, some people talk higher or lower depending on their mood. You know, your face says a lot. It's being aware of who we are and being able to put into play or to designate where we might need a little extra help. Um, now let's talk about words. Like I, I kind of said before is that you're going to choose your words. It, there's, there's a lot of factors in word choice for speeches. It could be familiarity with your audience. If it's a group that you really know versus a group that you kind of know or the age of the group or the group themselves you know if you're speaking to a group that you're not involved in choosing words and it's also choosing you know socio classes also come into play in word choice or how you have to present ideas and theologies as well all that comes into play so you want the audience to hear you you want the audience to be engaged you want the audience if it's persuasive especially you want to sway them in the direction of yay or nay or you know in the way you're wanting the speech to turn out if you want a new light to be put in somewhere you want to sway your audience on why it's a good idea that a new light is put in at this junction if you want to shorten the school day have it go from 10 to 3 it's being able to discuss and choosing the correct words and ideas and examples come great for stuff like that why the school day should be shortened what what are the benefits from starting at 10 as opposed to eight o'clock or maybe instead of going five days a week five excuse me five days a week you go four days a week the benefits of having a longer weekend anyway i'll go off on a tangent about stuff like that but you, it's choosing your words. So what comes into play when choosing the words for your speech is the familiarity of the audience. Are they familiar or unfamiliar? Are you considered an outsider or an insider to this group? That also has um, a play as words. And when, with that also comes <coughs> regional dialects and phrases. You think of it. Something very Southern. Y'all, it's very Southern. So, if a Southern personality or speaker or someone that is originally from the South or has lived in the South for so long, you don't bat an eye if someone starts off, hey y'all, with an exclamation or a speech or their introduction. But say someone who's not from the South, and that's how they open up, it can be a little, mm, hold your horses, I don't think you need to be saying that. And it's also... Phrases come into play regionally, you know, there's so many different regions in the United States alone, you know, and different regions within them. So you have Southern, but there's like different levels of Southern. There's Southern Southern, Texas Southern, New Orleans, you know, Louisiana, they are their own entity of dialects and phrases and 
accents. Um, Kentucky has different ones. We have more Eastern Kentucky and then Midwest Kentucky isn't, you know, Central Kentucky doesn't have a twang as, you know, some Eastern Kentucky and then you have Northern, but then you have like New York Northern, New Jersey, Boston, you know, all those, they all have their own, like Connecticut, they, there's, there's twangs of dialects. Then you have different Midwestern towns, and then you have the East Coast dialects as well. So you see where I'm going with here. All that comes into play in choosing your words and your phrases appropriately. So again, knowing your audience, are you familiar, unfamiliar, are you an outsider, an insider? I say that because, you know, that has a play in it. Um, formal versus informal, and that again, knowing your audience, who are you speaking to? And what's the purpose of the speech? You know, is it just... A casual thing with your teammates trying to pump them up for the next game or are you going forth trying to defend a thesis and to graduate two totally different formalities there all of these things come into play um, and then you could also establish credibility Whoop. see my hair goes crazy if I don't pay attention to it you can also um, establish credibility through and expertise through word choice. So, by your choice of language and choice of words and phrases, you can establish that you are credible in what you are speaking or an expert or talking to someone. Just like if you've ever heard a speech from a, you know, firemen, firefighters, but why, what helps you prevent fires? Their knowledge gives us credibility that they know what they're talking about. Um, I say that because, you know, elementary school is usually a fire truck comes to the school, the kids get to go look or vice versa. They always, there's always a fire safety week, like, you know, smoking about, only you can prevent forest fires. Again, tangent, sorry, sorry. Um, word choices can make all the difference. It talks about using simple and concise language. Um, Using shorter words, it's easier to follow any audience. You just, you don't want to lose your audience using, you want to keep their attention. And the best way to do that is to use concise and simple language. Um, comprehension falls for that. It's being accurate, you know. Say precisely what you mean to convey to the audience that you mean what you say. For not accurate, if there's half truths or white lies in there that are easily discernible, you're going to lose your credibility, you're going to lose your audience, and you're going to lose the message. It's all just poof, gone. Um, things when it comes to, <coughs> excuse me, credibility, best to avoid using jargon. Jargon is a peculiar language, a specific language for a specific group. Um, just kind of avoid that also it's really good to um i thought i had more on the what avoiding anyway um and then other ways to create credibility in it is to use concrete imagery um language serves as a mental placeholder um it refers to things that are not present so if you're say you're discussing something you'd be like um we use, use excuse me i just was loading did you see it like the wheels turning there language serves as a mental placeholder so by the choice of words so you could if you're just talking about a dog you say dog, and everybody automatically thinks of dogs, but they think of different ones. But if you go into more imagery, the large black dog, that creates a better image. The small tabby cat. The round ball. Like I know these are very simple uses, but you understand what I'm saying with concrete. The more specific and simple you can be, for imagery, it will help you in your world. So then from language, we choice words, we talked about how we present ourselves. Um, there's rhythm and word choice. Um, within 
vivid language cons um it basically is words that are sens um, sensuous cueing the mind for experiences of touch taste sound and smell sorry my cat's going nuts in the background um it helps vivid language helps paint an image in the audience's mind so there's repetition and rhythm which underneath that is alliteration um it's the same sound of series and words uh repeating words phrases sentences and even sounds and key moments think of dr seuss books i will not eat them on the, with a fox i will not eat them in the box i will not eat ingredients and ham i will not eat them sam i am you're repeating words you're repeating sounds or the the ABC, the up uh, the coconut treat, whatever that one is. Um, those are great words of alliteration. Um, there's tropes is with vivid language, and within tropes you have it's like metaphor, metaphor, simile, and irony. Metaphors are just figures of speech where two seemingly dissimilar things. Um, You gotta jump if you wanna fly. Da, 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 da. Uh, similes are metaphors that usually imply the word like. It's like an orange. It's like an apple. It tastes like chicken. That's a big one. It tastes like chicken. So if you use the word like, you have a me you have your metaphor, and then by adding like, it becomes a simile. And then irony is the trope for saying one thing but meaning another. Um, oh, you're so great. At... <laughs> and irony is generally used in the form of humor for um in satire and sarcasm so those are great with vivid language then it kind of goes on discusses more about it breaks down the different kind of languages like there's um, bias language sexist language uh slang and all that it's it's 2023, folks, and we, every year and every moment, the world in general is becoming more aware of ourselves and who we are. So language adapts to the world around us. Things that were in the norm to say decades ago are not the norm now. So it's just being aware of what is in the now. That's not to say that in the now is always correct and kind, but it's forever changing. And the slang's constantly changing, you know. If you think of slang from stuff that was really popular in the 80s or popular in the 90s or popular in the 2000s are not so popular now in the 2020s. So that's what they're discussing here. I want to recap and say tips on speaking style. So dress appropriately for your speaking situation. Present your best and most confident self. And that's what we're here to do in this class, this course, folks. Choose words that only reflect your expertise, but also relate to the audience. Remember, keep it simple. Makes it easier. Uh, use vivid language, repetition, and other artful language choices with the, when appropriate and possible. Don't put it in there if it don't need to be put in there because you will lose your audience. But, you know, create the imagery. It was a beautiful Sunday morning. I was sipping my apple spice cider. Okay. I get it. And then, lastly, avoid technical jargon, bias language, and slang. Again, it's pretty straightforward. With bias language and slang, you are putting things in a little box and you don't want to put yourself in a box. Oh no, nay nay, we're not here for little boxes. We're here to be expressive and we're here to confidently put ourselves out in the world and kindly put ourselves on the world. I say kindly, I'm a big, I'm a big fan component of kindness. Bias language and slang puts you in a box and can give you, can create an image of you that's not the image that you want to put out into the world when you're wanting to put out 
a specific vibe. Anyway, folks, multiple videos on this. This was just me discussing the language choice and the body language. So, your verbal language, your nonverbal language. Thank you so much, folks. Bye.